Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on uh, identity. Now, usually, after that particular lesson on sanctification, a lot of questions, because, uh, you know, the, the, the whole issue, the, the motivation is, how do we live sanctified lives? That, that's the main question. And that's why all these, these other questions come. You know, what is right, what is wrong? Um, and so on. And so uh, I understand that, uh, you know, many of these questions are coming from that perspective, you know, um, how do we live sanctified lives? So, um, there will be situations when, um, you know, which we haven't spoken about, and that's when you need to pray and ask God, most important thing, you be convinced in your own mind. And second, you make sure that you are not doing anything wrong. Right? For example, uh, what if you have to go inside a bar, sit in a table where three or four other of your friends are drinking? Is it right or is it wrong? You know? So you can't find chapter and verse, thou shalt not go into a bar. <laughs> it is not there. So how? what to do? So you have to ask yourself the question, why am I going there? I'm going there because I want to reach these people for Jesus. I'm not going to drink. Uh, I'll just drink maybe some water or Coca-Cola or some Sprite or something. But I want to talk to those people about Jesus. So if that is the place I have to go to talk to them, I'll go. I'm not afraid. God so loved the world, He left heaven and came to earth. Earth was so sinful. And He came here. He sat with you and me. He sat right here. He didn't say, oh, I cannot go there. No, He came. And He reached us. Right? So you think like that. As long as I am not sinning before God, but I am doing it to reach those people, it's fine. But if you are going there to drink, then that is wrong. So we have to judge. And if you, yes. yes. Uh, Pastor, I have two questions. Please go ahead. Uh, first one is like my opinion. Yes. Uh, I have seen a video in YouTube. It is like a Japanese girl, an uh, artist girl. Jesus took her to hell to show what things there. And then Jesus told her to draw what you have seen. She has drawn that. Uh, like when we watch movies, horror movies, or any killing movies like violence and fighting scenes coming, we are we enjoy in our flesh the scene, but our spirit will affect. That is what Jesus is telling to that artist. And she has been drawn that very nicely. And still that video is available in YouTube. So uh, the thing is, uh, which, uh, which we want to feed, like if we want to feed our flesh, we have to feed. If we want to feed our spirit, we have to go to the word of God. We have to read that. So that is my the first thing. The second question is, uh, if we in a close community, uh, a relationship, it may be a cousin, brothers and sisters. But I, I got salvation. I came out of that community things and all the idol worship, everything. But how to deal with them? Because if I go, uh, I'm not yoking with them, but the problem is some words or some situation, they are telling it's unfaithful. It's not comes to the word according to Bible mm. because they doesn't know. And if I mingle with them too much, I it will affect my spiritual life also. So uh, I have to move away and live according to my spiritual life or I have to be mingled with them. It's like, it's mm. not good for me. I can feel that. And one person from my church community, he got salvation, but his own mother didn't got salvation. Mm. He left his mother and he's live his life. He met a sal salvation girl and he had children, he's living. But his own mother got mental illness and finally she died mm. without salvation. When I heard this, I felt very bad. But in that situation, what we can do? It is our yeah. responsibility to take care 
own mother right yes but what to do because salvation is up to the lord we can give faithful words we can direct them towards jesus but salvation we could not able to sal give salvation to them god only can give the salvation so yeah so the first point is uh, correct right we want we want to feed our spirit uh with the word of god through prayer and worship but remember we we also need to feed our mind right that means for example i i spend a lot of time with technology i i'm learning technology i do i spend a lot of time here and why do i like technology because we are using that as a tool to reach the nations so i'm also learning new skills i'm i spend a lot of time with technology so i'm feeding my mind or i also feed my mind with general information the news what's going on why because that helps me understand the bible because i can see the bible being fulfilled but if i don't read the news if i don't know what's happening in the news i won't know that the bible is actually being fulfilled in my time so i like to read the news i like to know what's going on in the world right so we feed our spirit we also feed our mind we also take care of our body so yeah i spend time in the gym someone say why well, you you gym you supposed to be praying ah but i cannot pray if i don't have a healthy body right if i'm sick and lying in the bed how can i pray so i will go and exercise i will spend time exercising why because if i have a healthy body i can serve god right so we have to god has made us tripart being spirit soul and body we have to take care of all three aspects right so with that understanding yeah you make your decisions you know like what but of course don't do things just like in the body we don't want to eat things that destroy the body same way you don't want to feed your mind with things that destroy your mind same way you don't want to feed your spirit with things that destroy your spirit but do things that are good for your spirit soul and body so that's how you make your decisions right the second case is uh the way i would respond to that is each one must know where they are spiritually and to know what god is want wants them to do right so we don't disconnect necessarily from our family and friends who are not believers so i'll give you my own life example when i was in college engineering college you know uh first year when i went to engineering college um uh they just make you a roommate with anybody so i had three other roommates they were all non christians uh you didn't get a choice who was your roommate we just stayed together but i was being a believer but we were roommates from second year you can choose your roommate so i chose one of my friend in class we became roommates so we were roommates for the next 3 years but we were total opposites uh and i'm not saying this in any bad way but he i was you know i was a strong believer i was preaching i started a prayer fellowship etc but on my roommate I was total opposite he won the sm chain smoking competition in college he was drinking partying all that but we were roommates i was staying with him and we were good friends we were in the same class now in the 3 years it didn't affect me spiritually but here's what happened uh, when we were when we would spend time in the room he'll ask me questions what about this what about that and i'll just answer then after we finished college we both went to went overseas to the us and uh i think one or two years later suddenly one evening i get a call my friend calls me this my roommate friend he calls i've not been in touch with him now for two years we've lost contact those days we didn't have uh, instagram all those i mean whatsapp and all so it's not but he called me suddenly he got my number somewhere he got me in oh they said ashish i called you i want to tell you one thing your life still speaks to me today you know so we were opposites but i always believe light is more powerful than darkness so i don't care you can put the devil as my roommate i will expect him to get saved i'm not i'm not afraid and when i was in the us um i remember uh uh in my uh, my second year i think it was uh, so i i first year i was stayed in some in a house with all were all were believers then we all had to move out we so at that time i was looking for a place and then 
Anyway, I found this place where this man, this American boy, uh, he was older to me, and um, he was not a Christian at that time. And uh, I went and saw the place, and I, and of course I was praying, and I told him, I said, I want to come and I'll stay with you, housemate. And so same, we're saying the same house, different rooms, and we share everything. I said, I'll be a, I'll be a housemate. He told me, and so when we met, you know, he asked me what music you listen to. I said, gospel music. He said, do you drink? I said, I know I don't drink. He said, uh, do you, you know, meet with girls? I said, no, I don't. It's a full checklist. I said, no, 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 no. Then after that, he said, we can't be housemates. Then I prayed. I said, no, but I want to come and stay with you. And uh, he was shocked. Like, why he's coming to stay with me? But he said, okay. So I moved with him. Now, he was total opposite, you know, totally doing opposite things. When I moved in, he would, he showed me all his music and uh, he would listen to heavy metal, heavy rock music, put it on. Well, he would, every evening he'll come and he'll drink and, uh, you know, partying and girls and all that stuff. I was there with him. My prayer was, Lord, light is more powerful than darkness. I'll be there. I didn't preach to him. Uh, and evening, sometimes we'll sit and have dinner together. He will drink his stuff. I'll just have my, you know, juice or water or milk or whatever to finish. But then he'll ask me questions. What What does the Bible say here? Because even though he's living that life, inside there is something is searching. Something is. Uh, so I stayed with him. I didn't preach. I just whenever he asked me a question, I'll answer. Just be a friend with him. And I can tell you, within one year. His whole life changed. On his own, first thing, he got rid of all his music. One day I came home, he said, I should go see. So I said, what happened to Jeff? I mean, he had all this collection of uh, those days, you know, you have DVDs, CDs. All gone. He said, what did you do? Oh, I threw it off. I want to listen to Christian music. I never told him you have to listen to Christian music. Then one day I came home, he said, uh, go look in the fridge. So what happened? So, see, there's no beer, nothing. What happened? No, I decided I'm getting rid of it. Then he only started going to church. And he gave his life to Christ. So by the time that one, uh, one and a half years, or whatever that time was, I was with him, his whole life changed. And then now, you know, I think just one or two, one year back or two years back, again, we lost touch and I moved, he moved. But somehow he found me online. And he reached out to me and he called me like just uh, maybe like two years ago or something from the US. And he, and, he, and he called me and he said, This is what he told me. He said, Ashish, you're the only true Christian I have seen. He told me those words. Yeah. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying this to brag or anything. I'm just saying this is what happened. So to respond to your question, I would say. If we know where who we are in Christ, if we know what our life is, we won't be afraid. But if a person is not in that place, yeah, then you stay away, uh, because you you know then obviously, uh, if a person is weak, into sin and so on and so forth, so yeah, you protect yourself. But if you are strong, you know you're standing, you can stand next to the devil and not be afraid. I'm not saying purposely go and stand next to the devil. I'm just saying that's who God has made us to be. We need to know who we are. Right? Light. You are the light of the world. Who? You. So why are you afraid to make it shine? Wherever there is darkness, you say, that's where I should go. I am light. And light is always more powerful than darkness. I'm not afraid. Now, that doesn't mean we should be foolish and put ourselves into, you know, uh, sinful situations. But you need to know who you are. And if you know who you are, you can mingle with these people, not be afraid. Instead of them affecting you, you are there because you want to affect them. And you know you will affect them because light is always more powerful than darkness. That's the truth, right? But we need to know. If a believer doesn't know, yeah, then you stay away. So same thing in the last case. Uh, it's sad to see that you know that person moved away. I, I don't want to judge, but what if that person had stayed there, shown the love of Christ to his mother, 
maybe she could have been saved. You know? So I'm not judging the person. It, it could have gone both ways. Um, but, or at least he could have gone and lived separately, but gone and visited her and, you know, shared the love of Christ. In another way, of course, uh, once a person gets married, they want to have their own independent home, which is a good thing. We encourage that. But at least to relate back, to have that friendship, to have that relationship. And through that relationship, we can influence people and lead the person to Christ. Could have happened. I'm not saying should. That that's what they should have done. Could have done. Yeah. That's my response to it. But the problem is, Pastor, uh, her mother is also Christian only. But its denomination is different. Her mother is RC Christian and he is a Pentecost. So that's the problem. Hmm. Even though he showed love of Christ, he's telling everything. She is telling you should be here only. Hmm. This is what Jesus started from Peter. This is the true church. Don't go, son, there. That's it. Like that. Um, okay. So then that's fine. Then, you know, we take a stand for what we believe, but we still show love. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, I, for example, that case, yeah, you follow the, the son follows the faith. Um, doesn't get into practicing Catholicism, say no. But you're still my mother. I will love you. I will honor you as a mother. Uh, I will not. I don't honor the you know the practices, but I honor you as a mother. That's it. Beyond that, like you said, uh, we can't save anybody. We can only be there. It's only God who saves. So leave the result to God. Okay, so these are difficult questions, of course, and um, we have to do our best in how we journey through these things. All right, let's um, move forward to our next lesson, which we were supposed to start. Uh, but it's good that we ask questions uh, and help clarify things. All right, let's go here. Section 5, Identify with Christ, lesson number 43. So, this is a very important principle in the Word of God. Yeah, so technology, AI, um, virtual reality, gaming. So, again, just to mention, just very, just briefly. So, uh, we, we are not afraid of these technologies. Uh, we use these technologies for kingdom of God, right? So you see, look at technology as tools, uh, AI, VR, gaming, uh, how you can use these, virtual reality, how you can use these as tools for the kingdom of God. So, um, you know, and, and there are lots of applications for these things that I want to get into it. But what I would say is we are not afraid of these tools. All these tools can be used for good or for bad. We want to use it for good to further the kingdom of God. Yeah, we want to use it for good. So um, there are many ways and we can do it. Uh, fun, if you want to. So, I mean, like, you know, you can play virtual tennis also. You stand in front of your TV and you play tennis, tuck, 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 and so going to the ground. But you won't burn as much energy there, right? But, huh? see, uh, if I don't play games, uh, these these video games or virtual games, but if there are people who want to play, it's okay. As long as they don't get addicted to it. So that's the danger part, right? The, the danger part is people get addicted to it. But these tools can also be used for good, for example, in medicine, doctors are being trained using mm. gaming, using virtual reality. That's a new way to train doctors. You can learn, do perform surgery using these tools. Right? So it's being used, or pilots are being trained using virtual. So in, you know, in those days, you fly a plane, you crash, you'll die, and you also lose the plane. But at least now you can learn to fly using virtual reality, uh, these these technologies, where it's as though you're actually flying, but your life is not at risk, and the plane is not going to crash. But you're learning how to fly. Doctors are learning how to 
perform surgeries, not on real patients or even cadavers, but through virtual reality, right? So these tools, and these are just two examples, but these tools are being used in a positive way in many areas. And we have to think, how can we create games or virtual reality games, uh, interactions, where we can also bring the Bible in. And some people are doing that, right? So you'll find games, gaming things that are being created around Bible, like, you know, even simple a crossword uh, or puzzles around the Bible. So we can use these tools for good, which it is being done. But the negative side is there are also all kinds of other games, war games and, you know, all kinds of things that are addictive and destructive. Right? So we don't throw out the technology just because in some scenarios it's there's a negative result. We have to think about all the positive ways in which we can use this, and a lot of good is being done. Right? So, yeah. Uh, so, Pastor, I'm from a gaming background. I have studied about this thing, like gaming and um, 3D modeling and everything. So, uh, in in this like uh, field, mm -hmm. uh, we have to play games. Yes. And there are games like GTA 6, GTA 5, GTA 6 is coming and uh, there are cyberpunk and games like that. Those games have sexual content and uh, like the language of that game is like very modern type of language, like mm -hmm. secular world mm -hmm. language. And uh, like uh, there are jobs of game testers mm -hmm. and uh, there are uh, things like that, like fighting and all mm -hmm. and all and all. So like if we play that game, for our career purpose, for the job and for the things like if, like if someone is um, in that game, there is a sexual content, and I'm a mm. 3D modeler, and I'm making something. So is that I'm doing the right thing or the wrong wrong thing? But in my mind, in my heart, there is nothing. I'm just doing it for the go or for job. the job purpose. And um, if I'm also playing, there are many gamers who do uh, YouTube and all. So uh, for those things also, if I'm mm. like game, I'm putting a gameplay of GTA 5 and all the missions, all gameplay, what is in the game, what things are there. So if I'm doing in that way, what am I doing sin or like, can I do that? Okay. So we have to approach it in a very practical way. So one is, yeah, you need the job, let's say a person who's working in the gaming industry, okay, he needs a job, he or she needs a job uh, to earn money, all right. But what would I say? I would say try to position yourself in that space, in a place where you don't need to do things that are not good, that are not wholesome, right? So try to find a company that's maybe doing gaming in a, for a different purpose, right? Like we said, it's, it can be used for so many things. So find a company that's doing educational games, or find a company that's doing uh, wholesome games, right? Without sexual content, without violence, so on, right? Maybe a person is starting there is right now in this side. Yeah, then you realize, hey, but this is not helping me. Yeah, it's getting me money, but it's not helping me. Okay, you keep your job, I'm not saying just leave your job, but then ask God and then reposition yourself in that industry where, you can use the same skills, but in a very good way, okay, for good things. So reposition yourself. And there are so many opportunities where, like we were just mentioning, where these technologies are being used for good. So that's what I would suggest. Okay? And don't do it in a hasty way, just make the change, you know, so that you'll be using those same skills in a good way to help people. You know? So imagine you're creating educational games you know, uh, example like one so one game that's so I mean one tool that's so famous is Duolingo. You know, it's 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 a tool that combines AI, gaming, etc. That people are using all over the world to learn languages. You can learn Hindi, you can learn Spanish, you can learn French, and it's it's given. So you're learning language in a in a it's a gamification of the education process. But that's a nice tool, and it's become so famous all over the world. Yeah. So that's just one example, but like that, there's so many where you can use these technologies in a positive way. And so you, you reposition yourself in the industry. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, play games just like we play other things, but don't get addicted. Play healthy games. I mean, <laughs> clean, clean games, not things that are violent, not things that are sexual, but clean games. So if you're doing car racing, fine. If you're racing cars. Uh, if you're doing some adventure games, fine. You know, there's no violence. There's nothing evil. But you're doing it for recreational purpose. It's fine. Just like how somebody may go, you know, on a bike for a ride. Oh, yeah, you want to give those ideas or you want to be inspired. Yeah, all those things, fine. Yeah, the main thing is to stay away from what's evil, right? And you can because there are a lot of decent things there also. We just have to choose the right things. Okay, so, uh, yeah, like we said, all these are very practical questions that we, we come up when we talk about, you know, living sanctified in Jesus. Um, let me just introduce the next lesson and we'll go forward. So... Uh, in section five, when we talk about being identified with Christ, okay, this is a complete change, okay, from what we've been discussing. This is a complete change. In the Bible, we see a uh, truth. It's called identification, and uh, it, it, the, the two sides. So there is one is substitution, and there is identification. Substitution means one person represents many. Substitute. One representing many. What happened to the one affects the many. Adam sinned, but we all became sinners. Substitution. One affecting many. Christ died for our sin, and so we can all, those who believe, will become forgiven. Substitution. Identification is the reverse. Many in one. Okay. That means it's like many people were in that person, and as though they all did that or they all experienced that event with that person at that time. That's identification. You are in that person. Even though you were not there, in the mind of God, you were there. God is saying you were there. I'm making it yours. So, identification. The Bible says, in Adam we die. In Christ, we are made alive. That means we are all identified with Adam. But we are also, when we are born again, we are also identified with Christ. So substitution, identification. And so we are going to focus now on identification. I'll just give us an outline of this. We'll get into it next week. We will see that the New Testament teaches this. That in the mind of God, all of us as believers were identified with Christ in His crucifixion, in His burial, in His resurrection, in His ascension, and in his exaltation at the right hand of God. So God is saying, ah, this is what God determined, right? God decided that everyone who believes in Jesus will be identified with Christ. That means it's as though you were there when it happened to Jesus. Now we know we were not there. But in the mind of God, He determined this. And therefore, it is true for us today. When Christ was crucified, you were crucified. And we will look at the scriptures. I'm just giving outline. When Christ was crucified, you were crucified. That means you were nailed to the cross. So I didn't feel any pain. Don't worry about the pain. 
in the mind of God, you were identified with Jesus. And we'll see what is the result. So each step has a result, has an outcome. So when Christ was crucified, you were crucified. When Christ was buried, you were buried. I was buried. We were buried with him. When Christ resurrected, you and I resurrected. When Christ ascended, you and I ascended. When Christ sat down on the right hand of God, you and I sat down on the right hand of God determined in his mind. He said, this is what I'm giving to all of you. You're identified with Jesus and now it is yours. So this is spiritual truth. It is reality. So we need to understand it and learn how to walk in it. What does it mean? And learn how to walk in the reality of being identified with Jesus in his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation at the right hand of the Father. Okay? So, let's look at some scriptures here. In Romans 5, 12 and 19, which we referenced earlier, this is the whole thing about substitution. It says, yes, therefore, just as through one man, Romans 5, 12 and 19, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sin. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So one man sinned, everybody became sinners. That is substitution. He sinned. But the re reverse is also true. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Jesus was the only one who was obedient. And because of his obedience, we all became righteous. Okay? He did it, we benefit. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22, 47, 49. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from of the dead. As in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. So identification. In Adam, only death. In Christ, there is life. Right? So, just as we have embraced our life from Adam, yeah, we are natural people from Adam's race. We must embrace our life from Christ. In Adam we die. We are sinners, all that. But now in Christ, we are different. We have life. We are identified with Jesus. As was the man of dust, so also, this is verse 48, for, sorry, 40, let me read 47. The first man was of the earth, made of dust, the second man is the Lord from heaven. So he's saying, look, these two men, they're totally different. One was made of dust, earth. The other was the Lord from heaven. So how does it affect us? Verse 48. As was the man of dust, so also those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. So, our identity changes. In Adam, it's natural. We're from the dust. But you're not just from Adam. Now you have life in Christ. And in Christ we're alive. And as was, as is the heavenly, so also those, as is the heavenly man, so also those who are Heavenly. That means now you and I bear the same image and the life and the nature of the heavenly man. So that's what we have to understand. Now we are so easy and so used to living from the natural man. I can't do this, I can't do that, this, this. Okay. But listen, change your identity. Instead of looking at yourself as a descendant of Adam, Look at yourself as somebody who is from the heavenly man. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly or born of him, born from above. 
Verse 49, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So he's saying, see, we have borne the image of Adam, but now we have to bear the image of Jesus. In all its sense, spiritual, and one day, yeah, we will spiritual, physically also we'll have glorified bodies. Right now, yeah, it's still natural bodies. But now we can bear the image of the heavenly man spiritually that work is happening right so there are two identities your identity in adam your identity in jesus and we have to bear the image of the heavenly man live out of that identity so romans chapter 6 is the chapter that we are going to look at which teaches us this whole thing about identification and how to live out of that. Okay. So let's read a, a, a part of it. We'll read verses 1 to 10. And then we'll pick up uh, next week. But let's read Romans 6, 1 to 10. Paul says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So, you know, in Romans, and you're going to study the book of Romans in your third year. It's an amazing book. Uh, just, a, just amazing. And in the book of Romans, Paul intensely asks questions. And the answers are implicit. So here he asks, and we call it a rhetorical question, meaning you know the answer. But he asks, so the question is, what should we do then? Should we keep on sinning so that grace will abound? Answer is no. So he says, verse 2, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that, our, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. We'll pause there. We will look at the rest of the verses. But in, in these 10 verses, in, in the first five verses, he's telling us about the facts that we have been united with Jesus in his crucifixion, in his death, and in his resurrection. He's stating it. And then in verses 6 through 10, he tells us, what is the result? I mean, what actually happened when we were identified with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection? So let's look at this verse 3. The word baptize, the word baptize is simply means immerse. Now, anytime we read baptism, the word baptism, we normally tend to think about water baptism. But it is not water baptism all the time. It depends on the context. It's the word baptize, but the word baptize is used in different ways. For instance, Jesus said, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's Acts 1 verse 5. Right? You'll be baptized. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. You'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Right? But the word baptize is used with water. Okay. It's just being, with, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Here, as in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 
the word baptism is not talking about water baptism. It's talking about being baptized into Christ. Different. Notice there, verse 3. As many of us as were baptized, what are the next two words? Into water, not water. Into the Spirit, no. Into Christ Jesus. So he's talking about being immersed in Jesus. So the, read it, and don't read into it something it's not there. Some people read this and say he's talking about water baptism. He's not talking about water. He's not talking about water baptism because he's telling us right there what baptism he's referring to. You are baptized into Christ Jesus. I'm not talking about being baptized in water. Now, water baptism is an expression of this, symbolic of this, but this is reality. You're baptized into Christ. So when we are baptized in water, when you're immersed, that means you're buried, you're dead and you're buried with Jesus. You come out of the water, it represents your, resu your, your resurrection. It's symbolic. But the reality took place here in Romans 6, as Paul is telling us. We were baptized into Christ. Jesus. So when you and I are identified with Jesus, baptized means you're immersed, when you're brought into union with Christ, which is what this whole course is about, being in Christ. When you're brought into Christ, when you're baptized into Christ, what happens? Verse 3, you were baptized into his death. That means now you are identified with his death. That's identification. You and I were not here, we were not there when Jesus died. But through identification, we are actually baptized into his death. That means we were as though we were there in Christ when Christ died, when he was crucified. Because we are identified with him, because we are baptized into him. So in the mind of God, when Christ died, when Christ was crucified, you and I were crucified. So he says that, therefore, we were also, we were buried with him. So not only did we die, that is crucified with him, we were also, verse 4, we were buried with him. So when Christ was buried, you and I were buried. Through baptism in his death, that means because we've been baptized into death, yeah, so we died with him, we're also buried with him. That just was for that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So now, not only did we die with him, bury with him, but we're also raised with him. You all following me? That's what he's saying, verse 4. And we also were raised to walk in new life. Verse 5. For if we have been united in the likeness of a death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That means if we died with him, hey, then we're also raised up with him. So we are identified in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. We're identified with that. So, which part of us died? Which part of us was crucified? Verse 6. And what was the result? Verse 6. Knowing this. So, this is very important. Many believers don't know this. That's why he says, know this, knowing this. Knowing this. That our old man was crucified with him. So which part of you was crucified with Jesus? Purana Admi. Direct translation. <laughs> Our old man. Our old man was crucified with him. The old man is talking about that old sinful nature. 
the nature that we received from Adam. Because all of us by default are connected to Adam. We received that. But that part of us, the old man, that sinful nature, God put it to death. Crucified with Jesus. So when Jesus died on the cross, a lot of things happened. We know our sins were put upon him. He paid the penalty for us and all of that. But now look at this. Something more happened. When Jesus died on the cross, you died. I died. Our old man died with him, was crucified with him. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with. So actually your old man is dead. He's gone. Not alive. So some people say, inside me there is old man and new man. No. Your old man is dead. It's not inside you. Are you understanding? Sometimes you'll hear some people preaching. Inside you there is old man, there is new man. You don't have old man. Because the Bible says old man is crucified. Yes, when your question. The old man is the sinner who identifies with sin, no pastor. The old man is our old sinful nature. Yeah. Or we can also use the phrase, some people use the phrase Adamic nature. So it's the nature that was in us, the propensity to sin. Yeah. So that nature of us is dead. Gone. And uh, now whatever mistake we make is because of our unrenewed mind. Our unrenewed mind and our uncrucified flesh. Uncrucified flesh. So whenever uh, when so whenever someone makes a mistake, it's not because of their identity with old man. Correct. It's just their unrenewed mind. Yes. So yeah, I just wanted that clarity, Pastor, because yes. now the work is little less. Less. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So right now, we are not trying to change our nature. That only God can change, which He has done. He has given us the responsibility now to change our mind and to change the desires of our flesh with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. But uh, we're just kind of going verse by verse. <laughs> I like, I like emphasize this verse 6 now. So, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. And what was the result? The body that the body of sin might be done away with. The body of sin or that sinful nature or that person of sin inside you. Or some versions say, the power of sin should be broken. So when the old man was crucified with Jesus, the power of sin over your life was broken. That the body of sin might be done away with. And what is the result? The result is that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's the result. So when the old man was crucified, God was saying, from now on, you are no longer a slave of sin. Okay. So we'll pause here. One verse to memorize. Romans 6, verse 6. Romans 6, verse 6. Okay. Please memorize that. We'll continue this next week. Romans 6, verse 6. Please memorize that. Thank you. Okay. You can take a break. And I'll get ready for the next class. Thank you.